had to give up one of your five senses, which one would it be? Well, I'm already visually impaired. <laughs> I had a brain injury about seven years ago, um, and it damaged my optic nerve. So you can't fix it. No. So you value your eyes. Yes. So you wouldn't give up your eyes. What about your touch, taste, smell, hearing? Uh, maybe smell. You give up your taste when you give up your smell. They go together. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Everything would be bland. Do you think there's an afterlife? Um, I don't believe there is. I, I don't. Isn't that depressing to think that we're all waiting around to die and there's no hope of eternity? I've never thought about it that way. It just, I think we pass and... Pass where to? You know how we say someone passed on? Right. Where did they pass on to? I don't know. <laughs> um, do you think about your own mortality, your own death? Yes. Does that scare you? No. Come on, everybody's no. scared of death. It doesn't? I had, I had the brain injury, and with that, I, I flatlined for a couple of seconds. And so I, I faced a near-death experience, and it, you don't know. You don't know that it's happening, and so it's not scary for me. Do you think God exists? I believe in a higher power. Is this higher power intelligent? Yes. Is the higher power moral? Uh, moral? Yeah. Does the higher power believe in right and wrong? Hmm. Yes. So you're really talking about God? <laughs> a, moral, a moral eternal being that created you and gave you your eyes and your hearing and your taste buds and sense of smell and the beauty of the sky. You know the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Did you know that? No. Every time you look at the sky, there's knowledge of God. There's a the knowledge of his creative hand. It couldn't happen by accident. I mean, you study the sky. Have you ever been in awe of the sky, the beauty of the sky? We kind of take it for granted. Or a hummingbird. Ever seen a hummingbird come close to you and realize that its wings are moving at 500 times a second and being in awe, not only of the hummingbird, of the one who created the hummingbird. Would you rather God to be just a higher power that stays at its distance or an all-knowing God that knows exactly what you do and knows every hair on your head? Which would make you feel most comfortable? I guess one that knows me very well. Okay. Well, the Bible says God knows you by name. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every atom that makes up your eyes. 137 million light sensitive cells in your eyes. Each eye. God created that. You've got focusing muscles when they're working well that move an estimated 100,000 times a day. He made every atom in your eye. He's intimately familiar with that atom because he made it. And what I'm trying to do is enlarge your image of what God is like. He's not an old man in the sky reaching out to touch Adam's finger like you see that picture sometimes. Nothing like that. He's omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, which means he can do all things, sees all things, and knows all things. Do you think you're a good person? I think so. If heaven exists, are you going to make it there? If heaven exists, I think I would. <laughs> so I'm going to put that to the test, and it's, it's going to do you a favor, okay? In the long run, so be patient with me. How many lies have you told in your life? A, couple, a handful, I'm sure. More than that. Have you ever taken something that belonged to someone else, irrespective of its value in your whole life? I mean, have you ever stolen something? No. Ever downloaded music off the internet that's not yours? Yes. <laughs> that's theft. Have you ever used God's name in vain? I'm sure, yes. That's blasphemy. It's taking God's name, the one who gave you life, and using it as a cuss word to express disgust. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? No. Because you'd dishonor her horribly. And when we use God's name as a cuss word, we dishonor him. And it's called blasphemy, and it's very serious. Okay, one to go, and I appreciate your patience with me and your honesty. Jesus said, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever looked at a guy with lust? That's a <laughs> nod. <laughs> yes. So, Val, I'm not judging you, but you've just told me you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterer at heart. <laughs> kind of shocking, isn't it? All I'm doing is turning the mirror back on you so you can see yourself morally from God's point of view. Get to heaven. Yeah, so where would you go? Oh, well, somewhere else. Yeah. The video will continue in a few seconds, but I wanted to remind you to please subscribe to our channel and click on the notifications bell. And don't forget to like, comment, and share. Thank you.
if God judges you by the Ten Commandments, we've looked at four of them, you're going to be guilty on Judgment Day. Would you go to heaven or hell? They're the options. Wow. I would go. Now, does that concern you? Yes. <laughs> it's got to concern you because you so love life. So tell me, what did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Any idea? He sacrificed himself. And do you understand the legal implications of that? The legal implications? Uh, I'm not sure. Let me share them with you and get your thoughts. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. We broke the law. Jesus came and paid the fine. If you're in court, even though you're guilty, if someone pays your fine, the judge can let you go. He can say, look, Val's guilty, but someone's paid a fine. She's out of here. And justice can be done. Justice is served. You're let go completely free, even though you're guilty, because another paid your fine. Well, God can legally let you live forever. He can commute your death sentence because of that suffering, death, and resurrection of the Savior. Just before Jesus died, he cried out, It is finished, which is a very weird thing to say as last words, unless you're the Son of God, suffering for the sin of the world, paying the fine so that sinners can go free from the demands of eternal justice. Does that make sense? Yeah. What you have to do in response is very simple. A child can understand it. You must repent of your sins. That is, don't continue to uh, play the hypocrite. Say, I'm a Christian and fornicate and lie and steal and blaspheme. You live the life. But that won't save you. What will save you is trust in Jesus. Like putting on a parachute can save you if you trust the parachute. If you're going to stand on the edge of a plane and jump without a parachute, you're not wise. Put your faith in the parachute. Trust it, and it will save you. And the Bible says God's provided a parachute. He's provided the Savior. If you repent and trust in him, God will forgive your sins and grant you everlasting life as a free gift. One more thought. At the moment, you're like someone on the edge of a plane 10,000 feet up. She's going to jump, and this is her plan. She's going to flap her arms. She's going to try and save herself. And I'd say, hey, don't do that. Trust the parachute. So don't try and save yourself by saying, I'm a good person. It's not going to work. Transfer your trust from yourself to the Savior. Does that make sense? It does. This is so important. Thank you for listening to me. I'm, I'm honored to speak to you. Now, are you going to think about what we've talked about today? Yeah, I liked your parachute analogy. I was just <laughs>